Hello. Uh, Hi, welcome to our 2022 Summer Systematics Institute Research Symposium. Um, this is our 28th year of the Research Experiences for Undergraduates program at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, and so I think what's exciting about that is that for most of the interns participating in this summer, this program started before they were even born. <laughs> So we've had a few years to, to really dial, dial in our, our process and, and what these folks experienced for the summer. Um, but I would just like to start by saying that, that the, the nine speakers you're going to hear from today beat out four, over 500 other people for these summer positions. Uh, this is a really competitive program. Lots of people want to come and experience research uh, and biodiversity science here at the California Academy of Sciences. And each of the people that's here today presenting their summer research are here because they are the best of the best. And I think that you're gonna see that in these presentations. Um, this summer, they, they did all sorts of things. They, they uh, learned about all of the aspects of life at the California Academy of Sciences. We, we feel fundamentally that the California Academy of Sciences should nurture students and future scientists who not only do great science, but communicate great science as well. And so all of these summer interns had experiences in things like digital engagement, um, communicating their science through social media outlets or, or preparing to, uh, workshops in public programs, how to present science and their own research out on the public floor. Um, they met with folks from public programs in education they met with former alumni of the SS 28-year SSI program that are in all different walks of life. They met with our current postdocs and grad students to explore different career paths and, and potential avenues for them as they grow in their lives and in their pathways. Um, and so it was a really robust program. We started this program out with a week in the field. We went up to uh, Marin County uh, and these, these, uh, this cohort of students was thrust together in tents, really tiny tents, <laughs> two person tents for the first moments that they be, that they knew each other. Um, and we spent a week up there learning all about how field work is done, how natural history is done, how biodiversity science is studied from the ground up. And then we came back here to the academy where they learned all the methods that we're using here, including sort of cutting edge genomics, cutting edge morphological techniques, and really immerse themselves in the world of what biodiversity science looks like in 2022. Um, and so you're going to hear about aspects of each of those projects over the next few hours. Uh, but it wasn't all done in isolation, and it certainly takes a village to raise young scientists. So I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca Johnson uh, to, to say some things. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Um, like Lauren said, um, one this program, Lauren and I co-direct the program, but it takes the entire academy to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And one of the most amazing things about working at a natural history museum, and specifically the Cal Academy, is that we're surrounded by experts like in everything, right? We have digital engagement experts. We have creative studio experts. We have experts in communicating to the public. We have folks that hold, like throw a huge party for 4,000 people every Thursday night, right? And um, plus all of the science that we do. And so all of those people make the students' experience more robust, just having the option to learn from those folks. Um, and there are some specific folks that we want to thank. I mean, the first group of people that we want to thank are all the mentors um, who dedicated their time this summer to work one-on-one, -on -one, or in some cases, like three mentors to one intern. Um, this summer and gave their time to get to know them as people and help foster their growth as young scientists. And um, we wanna specifically thank Jacob and Kate who were kind of the overseers, teaching assistants, like go-tos for anything, whether it's how to align your sequences or what to eat for lunch um, or how to solve like almost any problem. And so we really wanna thank Kate and Jacob, both who are alumni of this program. Um, who really knew, I think, in a special way what the students needed to succeed. So I want to thank them a lot. We want to specifically thank Athena and Lynn from the CCG for all of their guidance and mentorship and hand-holding and 
tear wiping and uh, all of the things that happen in the CCG, um, in addition to um, creating great data and making that um, possible. So thank you so much. Um, we want to thank Laurel Allen from um, Digital Engagement and Aria as well um, for giving workshops and helping all of the students in all of their social media um, slash how to communicate with the public um, on social media, all the aspects therein. Um, we want to thank Kyle from um, PE&E, from Public Programs, who gave a workshop about how to communicate to the public. Um, so thanks to Kyle. Um, to all of the curators from IBSS and postdocs who talked about their research and gave lectures and spent their time talking to the students. To all of the collection managers and curatorial assistants who gave tours, answered questions about specimens, helped people find specimens, and gave a little insight into the um, expertise and care that it takes to take care of our collections that they all worked on this summer. Um, and to the postdocs and graduate students who did the early career research panel and talked about their path, paths through science and education, it's really valuable for our students to hear from all of you about their experience and we really, really appreciate it. And um, we also had some additional help from Alex and Olivia in accounting who got us some really awesome academy jackets for our interns this year, so we wanna thank them. Um, and Richie and Lynn from Nightlife, who took a lot of field with a lot of requests for guests for Nightlife um, and really like welcomed the students as full Academy like colleagues and let them bring their friends to Nightlife, which is one of the fun things about this. The 21 and over friends. 21 and over friends. <laughs> um, and only 21 and over interns. Um, <laughs> So, so really, um, as you can see, like that's just a short list and we didn't have time to name everyone by name, but um, you know, it's one of the things that I love most about working here is working with all those people and having our nine new colleagues kind of part of that fold this summer and then in an ongoing way is like fostering that idea that we're all in it together and we can share our expertise and learn from each other always um, is one of the things that I know the students got out of the summer because we learned from them as well. Um, it's not just that we learn, they all learn from us, like having them here helps us be better scientists and better communicators and better mentors because we learn from them. Um, and so now... Well, and just a word of warning that <laughs> once we get you here, we don't like to let you go. <laughs> as, as Rebecca, who was part of the first cohort of this program, can attest, <laughs> along with Jacob and Kate over here in the audience. And, and Aria, Aria. And Aria. Maya. No. Maya's at a conference, but Maya, she were here. So you're, you're in the fold forever. <laughs> um, so we're about to get started with your presentations, but before that, we want to turn it over to Dr. Shannon Bennett, who's our Dean of um, Science and Research Collections, to kind of welcome everyone and um, kick us off. All right, thanks so much. Well, I couldn't be more thrilled to welcome everybody to this amazing event. I think all of us here at the Academy look forward to this day with a great deal of enthusiasm and excitement. Um, I know you're all thinking a little bit more nervousness, but really, truly, this is a wonderful celebration of an amazing summer. So short, though. So uh, I do. I want to say how honored I am to be uh, to be able to participate in this program, and how um, how we couldn't do it uh, without uh, such amazing interns, without such amazing uh, leads, Rebecca. And Lauren, thank you so, so much for leading this program this year. Another amazing and successful year. And I want to echo what uh, Rebecca had mentioned a couple of times, the word colleagues. Uh, sitting down on B2 and hearing the hubbub, the energy, good hubbub, the amazing <laughs> energy, the, the light bulbs blowing off and, and discovery and all the collaborative conversations that you're having with each other and with our community has been so incredibly important and rejuvenating for me as a scientist. So you are colleagues, you're truly colleagues, you're partners, you're collaborators. And you're so important to us because we as a group really need, we're called to reinvent what science is like uh, in the 21st century and what the society needs out of science in the 21st century. And it needs bold, brilliant, innovative people that are tuned in to, uh, to a thriving society that also needs to change and become more diverse. So biodiversity meets diversity and together uh, we need you, we need each other to really change uh, the face of science and how science is done and how, how we can all really improve because 
of science. So this is just the beginning. You are amazing colleagues. And I have, I can't even imagine where your paths will take you, but I know it will take you to greatness. So thank you so much and let the day begin. All right, so here we go with our presentations. Um, our first speaker this morning will be Holly Spindon, um, who will be talking to us about the morphological trait variation of Castilea affinis compared with species co-occurrence in the coastal California species complex. And Holly's a student at Colorado State University, and this summer she worked with Dr. Sarah Jacobs. All right, come on up, Holly. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Holly Spinden. Um, I'm a student at Colorado State University. And then today, or the summer, I've been working with Dr. Sarah Jacobs and Magdalene Lowe, um, studying morphological trait range variation and species co-occurrence in the coastal California Castilea species complex. So first of all, Castilea, you may have heard of the um, it known as the paintbrush flower. It's a really iconic North American wildflower um, found throughout North America, but mostly in, on the Western side is where it's uh, known to be. Um, it is a very di diverse uh, species. Um, San Francisco is actually essentially the uh, epicenter of that diversity, um, but there are 200 species, but they only share about four common floral morphs. Um, and then you can see up here, uh, it's these four. And they are, um, they make telling the different species apart very difficult. Um, the taxonomy in Castilea has historically been uh, very difficult to use. And this is for a number of reasons. First of all, due to that overlapping morphology. And that doesn't necessarily refer to the morphology physically overlapping. It means that the um, measurements of those morphological traits will overlap. So in this chart, you can see that um, the ranges for traits given, so for example, leaf length, 20 millimeters to 130 millimeters, overlaps significantly with um, five millimeters to 20 millimeters. So if you found a individual with a 20 millimeter long leaf, you might not necessarily know whether that was uh, any one of these particular species. Additionally, the geography of the species overlap significantly. So um, geography is most because the morphology is not able to be very diagnostic for different species, the geography is used. Um, however, because the geography overlaps a lot throughout California and the United States, um, this isn't necessarily a great diagnostic uh, way to tell species apart either. So this results in species complexes, which are common in many different lineages, not just Castilea. Um, but they're essentially groups of um, organisms that are very similar, um, but known to be more than just one species. And they're best delimited, best delimited by using multiple lines of evidence, including morphological, ecological, and genetic. Uh, lines of evidence. And so this summer I was focusing on using morphological data. And I was looking specifically at the coastal California species complex, um, which is composed of five main cast members of Castilea uh, that you see here up on the screen. Castilea affinis, littoralis, YDI, latifolia, and mendocinensis. Um, and they're uh, recognized by their perennial um, life history, which means that they live for multiple years, their red or pinkish coloration, um, and their long beak or corolla, which is that um, this yellow part that you can see sticking up out of the flower. Um, they have similar morphologies, habitats, and pollinators. And then they also have very similar geographic ranges. Um, I was focusing on Athenis which is in the far left. And you can see that it is the, uh, has the broadest range of all of the species. Um, but it, you know, for example, if you were to find a species or an individual from 
Mendocino County, you might not necessarily know which one of these species is, especially if it has um, that red coloration, that perennial life history, or that long beak. So it's a very long, difficult project to um, parse apart the species complex, and it will require multiple lines of evidence. I was just focusing on the morphological aspect of it. Um, so the objectives of my study were to quantify the range of morphological trait variation in Castilla affinis throughout its northern range, um, and then to compare that range of trait variation to the geographic ranges of other species within the coastal California species complex. Um, we were hoping to observe patterns of trait variation um, across geographic space, and then hopefully identify areas for further study because um, differences in trait variation might indicate gene flow or hybridization between different members of the species complex. Um, so we expected to see changes in the range of trait variation uh, between counties or between geographic space, especially in areas where um, this species overlaps with the geographic range of other members of the coastal California complex. Um, and we expected to see that because of the ease of hybridization within the species complex and within the genus. So we did this by using morphological data. So we collected um, the length of four different traits, one leaf trait and three floral traits. These floral traits are the bract length, calyx length or sepal as it's more commonly known and corolla length or petals as they're more commonly known. Um, the top image is a nice diagram of um, what those look like pressed down and then um, the lower image shows you what that might look like on the flower. So we tried to get three measurements per trait per stem per specimen, essentially. Um, and a lot of those measurements were not available simply due to the nature of pressed specimens. Um, but we did our best and we were able to collect a fairly significant amount of data. I think over 200 specimens were measured. Um, and then other part of our uh, methodology was Georeferencing. So we used the locality information on specimen sheets to um, locate the specimens to a specific coordinate as best as we could. And then um, the next part of our methodology was data visualization and data analysis. And we were not using any statistical analysis, um, but we were able to map the uh, georeferenced specimens and just visualize kind of where those ranges overlap and um, how that trait range might vary across different counties and across geographic space. So the first objective was to quantify the range of trait variation um, throughout the northern range of Castle Athenis. So on the y-axis you see um, that is millimeters of length of each trait. Um, so leaf length, bract length, calyx length, and curl length. And as you can see, the flower traits are a lot, have a lot more of a narrow range. This is likely because they're um, more susceptible to um, selection pressures, such as pollinators. Um, and then here is a actual uh, quantification of those trait ranges. We compared them back to the flora of North America, which uh, has species descriptions about each um, about each species within the complex, and we found that um, our ranges of data fit fairly well within the range of trait variation um, stated in the flora of North America. Our data did skew a little bit on the smaller size. Um, we hypothesize that this might just be due to the nature of um, herbarium specimens and the fact that that is dead plant material, whereas the flora of North America would be using a lot living, um, fresh plant material for those ranges. And um, we were able to find a, a range for bract length, which was not given in the flora of North America, so that was some interesting novel finding. Um, and then the next part was ne our next objective was to see how um, the specimens that we measured compared to um, the ranges of other members in uh, this species complex. 
So here is a graph that simply shows where our, specim our specimens do reference are in black. And then um, the colored dots show the other members of the species complex and where they overlap. And as you can see, there's a lot of overlap throughout the range. We were hoping to find um, specimens in areas where there were no, there was no overlap with other species, um, kind of as a control. But as you can see, we were not really able, our herbarium just simply doesn't have that material. Um, and then we can take that information and then um, use it to an an analyze this graph, which is, it's a lot of data, but um, essentially each line represents a different trait. And then um, from left to right, you see the uh, county from north to south. And so this is what we were using to visualize our data and see um, whether there were patterns or not within um, that trait range variation. Um, as you can see, um, south of Marin County, the uh, ranges vary, um, but they're mostly the, the mean of each uh, trait per county is pretty consistent. Whereas north of Marin, there is, there is a little bit more variation, but our sample size is just too small to really um, observe any clear patterns about this variation. So because we didn't really observe any clear patterns in trade variation across county, we then tried to find other patterns in, um, in geographic space. So we manually located coastal points um, and separated them out from inland specimens. And we compared them to see if there was any difference in um, the lengths of those traits. And we, again, didn't really see much of a pattern. Some counties might show a little bit of variation, such as Marin County, but um, this in Marin County in particular, this is likely due to the fact that um, there's a subspecies, uh, Castilea, neglect, Castilea affinis subspecies neglecta measured. And so these are kind of isolated instances that really don't give us a lot of information about uh, the species complex as a whole. And so the very last test that we did was a Mantel test. And that um, was just to analyze, to see if there was a correlation between morphological distance and geographic distance uh, between all of our specimens. And the blue line in the middle er, represents uh, that correlation. As you can see, it is slightly positive, but it is in no way um, strongly positive or um, it does not indicate there is a significant correlation between these two variables. So this essentially means that our data was uh, pretty much not inconclusive, but it, um, it really did not tell us much about um, the whether or not gene flow was happening in uh, these counties. Um, we were able to find that the range of variation fits into the species descriptions given in the flora of North America. Um, however, this information given in flora of North America is not necessarily diagnostic anyway. So, I mean, that really doesn't tell us much about um, whether this is data that can be used uh, to further um, delimit the species in the species complex. Um, we also found that there was no pattern in the morphological traits found across geographic space. Even when we went further than just county by county, when we looked at um, coastal versus inland, we did not find any patterns. Um, and again, even though we weren't looking at hybridization, we did not find any data that might indicate um, something further might be going on, such as gene flow or hybridization between species in those areas where species co-occur. And so, um, but this is by no means a failure or anything like that. Um, it just is preliminary data. It's one species and it's just one of many lines of evidence um, that will be used to parse apart the California, um, coastal California species complex. It might indicate that these morphological traits are not the best way to diagnose species. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean morphological traits in general aren't good to diagnose species. Um, or it might. It, I think additional studies on the ecology and genetic information about the species and the species complex will be needed to answer that question. Um, but this is a really great way to just um, understand how really complex and complicated this species complex really is. So 
that was our project. I want to thank um, the California Academy of Sciences, Drs. Lauren and Rebecca, uh, Esposito and Johnson, and then everyone else in the SSI program, my mentor, our, all of our mentors, lecturers, Kate and Jacob, um, any, and any other supporters of SSI, as well as the NSF for funding. And then uh, the image credits go to Mark Egger and Magdalene Lowe. But thank you for listening. Uh, any questions? Great. Thank you. I love the glam photos of those beautiful paintbrushes. Um, so I live in Marin, and I was really remarking on how extremely variable the traits were across the board, whether they were released from selection or not. And I'm wondering if there's other, what you think might be other drivers of variation? Is Marin County just got more habitat types? Uh, anyway, happy to hear what you thought, and great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is um, a really good question. I think that there are definitely a, a few things that could affect that variation. Um, I think hybridization is not out of the question still. I think just based on the um, nature of our data, we were not able to observe anything that might indicate hybridization, um, but uh, ecological um, variables will probably play a role in that variation, um, whether that's substrate or habitat, habitat type, climate, um, elevation. I think those are all variables that would be really interesting to explore um, this complex further. Yeah, any other questions? I'm curious, like I imagine in the collection there was specimens from a range of years. Like I, I, I'm curious if you explored any of that, like whether annual variation has anything to do with driving that like morphological variation. Yeah, that is a really great question um, as well. I think that, um, yeah, that kind of gets into urbanum specimens as a uh, way to collect data and the fact that um, because you're using just herbarium sheets. You can only collect, a, if you were a collector, you could only collect um, plants of a certain size to fit onto them. And so I think that is a really um, interesting, yeah, that's, thank you for bringing that up, I think. <laughs> Sorry, I don't really know how to um, answer this concisely, but um, yeah, I do think that older, older specimens are probably going to show larger um, flower, or not, not necessarily larger flowers, but larger stems. They also are, um, it can be more difficult to tell apart the axillary stems versus primary stems. And what is um, the mate, uh, I guess, like what is um, the major, yeah, just what is a primary stem and what is an axillary stem with that older material. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, what was your favorite part about this summer? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I think my favorite part, part of um, working on this project this summer was probably just being able to work with all of the specimens in the collection. It was really amazing to see um, just how old some of those specimens were and the fact that, you know, people were collecting the same things 100, 150 years ago that we're um, still fascinated by today. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Holly. Let me get my notes. Let's take my mask off fast. One second. All right. Um, next up we have Cheska Ledesma, um, who will be talking to us about new species of Cablina from South Africa and a revised phylogeny. And um, Cheska worked with me and um, Dr. Terry Gossner and Lynn Bonomo this summer, and she hails from Lawrence University in Wisconsin. So come on up, Cheska. <laughs> Thank you. 
are. Ice cream sounds good. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Hi, my name is Cheska Ledesma, and this summer I worked with Dr. Rebecca Johnson, Dr. Terry Gossiner, and Lynn Bonomo, um, and I worked on new species of Kedlina from South Africa and the revised phylogeny. So for those of you that don't know, Kedlina is a genus of nudibranch. And for those of you that don't know what nudibranchs are, nudibranchs are marine mollusks with no shells. So they're a type of sea slug, and nudibranch means naked gill, which means their breathing organ or the breathing apparatus is outside of their body. They're hermaphroditic, and they have a lot of different colors, as you can see from these pictures. Um, and they eat a variety of foods, which give them these colors. So they eat things such as sponges, hydroids, anemone, even jellyfish. And so over here um, on your right is, um, are some of the California species that you can find along the California coast. While over here are just a couple of pictures of other varieties of nudibranchs. So a little background about Kalina and South Africa. So Kalina used to be grouped with the family Chromodoridae before being clarified into the family Kalinidae. Um, they are found in northern temperate and subtropical regions and are in most intertidal and shallow depths in every ocean basin. So they have ovoid mantles, which means they have an oval shaped body and they have lamellate rhinophores over here on the right. Um, Mm -hmm. I, sorry, I'm trying to figure out the pointer, but over here on the right, you can see these rhinophores, which are sensory organs at the top of these nudibranchs, and um, lamellate just means that they have those lines over there, like you can see. So um, we found four undescribed species in South Africa about 40 years ago, so it's been a long time coming, <laughs> um, but I am describing these species, species um, over the summer, and they are also the only representatives of the Kalina genus found in the South African area. So a little bit about the biodiversity and evolution in Kalina. So Kalina is a great model for regional and global biodiversity questions. They are endemic species in many areas. They have wide distributions, and a lot of species have overlapping ranges with some known barriers, some known physical barriers, and no obvious barriers in some areas. Um, as you can tell, many Kalina have similar body shapes and colorations. These are two different species, but they look very similar. They look almost the same. And so it's very hard to tell the differences without molecular and morphological data. This means that there's a lot of cryptic diversity in temperate species or hidden diversity, since we don't know whether species are two different species or the same species without the data that we have been collecting. So nudibranchs have the greatest diversity in the tropics and in the subtropics. So they're more heavily researched in this area. And so nudibranchs in temperate areas such as Kadlina aren't as heavily studied. So we lack a lot of information about the evolution of this genus, as well as their relationship with other nudibranchs. So th there were found to be like close relationships between South African and North Atlantic species in the nudibranch genera Lamatia and Polycera, but we aren't sure whether those close relationships between South African and North Atlantic species are true for the Kedlina genus. So during my SSI project, I used morphological and molecular data to help describe the species from South Africa. So I use Sanger sequencing for 16S and CO1 genes, um, but no new, there were no new sequences for species three and four. We only had morphological data for these species because the species were rarer than species one and two. And so I only sequenced species one and two. I also created a revised phylogeny for the Kevina genus using the new sequences that I had sequenced as well as some sequences from GenBank. So these are some pictures of the new species. So this is species one and species two. So as you can tell, they look very similar. They are white in color and have these brown spots on them. And the only way that you can tell them apart is that species one has this brown hourglass shape over here, um, this brown stripe on their backs, while species two doesn't. However, oh, sorry about that. Species one doesn't always have this. There are some, some species that are species one that don't have this brown stripe in the back. So it's very hard to tell the differences between these two species without the morphological and molecular data. So Kalina species three and four look very different from one and two. They're a lot bigger for one thing. And species three has this blue outer body and these black spots with blue outlines. 
while species four is brown in color and has this dark W shape on its back. So moving on to my methods. First, what I did was I collected some morphological data together with Dr. Terry Gosliner. And so I don't wanna to focus too much on the morphological data since I did focus a lot on the molecular data during my project, but I did work um, with Dr. Gosliner and we looked through the dissection microscope and dissected the um, reproductive system as well as the buccal mass, which is the mouth areas that show the jaws, the radula, which are the teeth of the nudibranchs. So over here, you can see a couple of pictures. So over there on the left um, are pineal spines. And so not all Kalina species have pineal spines. Not all nudibranchs have pineal spines. There are some species that do. And pineal spines are basically spines on the penis that allow a nudibranch to attach to another nudibranch during mating, um, especially since there's strong wave action in these shallow areas where some of these nudibranchs are found. And on the middle is a picture of the radula, which are the teeth of the nudibranch, and this is under the scanning electron microscope. So once we isolated the buccal mass, um, we looked at it under the scanning electron microscope. And over here is the reproductive system. So this is a trace drawing that Dr. Gosliner made under the dissecting microscope, when you can see the reproductive system and trace over it. So moving on to the molecular data collection. So as I mentioned previously, I used Sanger sequencing. I extracted the DNA from all the specimens that I had, amplified it using polymerase chain reaction, and then gel, I used gel electrophoresis to check the clean PCR product, the PCR product before cleaning and sequencing this product on the ABI machine. And once I had those sequences, I used Genius to create consensus sequences, and then I aligned the sequences using Alview for both CO1 and 16S genes, and then I used Mesquite to concatenate both the CO1 and 16S genes. So when making the trees, I used IQ tree and Mr. Bayes to create maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference trees. So I did this for both 16S and CO1, as well as a concatenated tree. And then I also used ABGD for species delimitation to make sure that all these species were actually different species and were not grouped together. So during my ABGD analysis, these are my results. These are the CO1 results. I did species delimitation for both CO1 and 16S. They had very similar results, but 16S tended to oversplit a lot of the groups in a way that was not supported by morphological data. So I decided to show the CO1. Um, species delimitation instead. So there are 16 distinct groups, as you can see, and species one and species two for Kadlina were distinct. So this is my tree. Um, this is the most accurate tree depiction that I have. It is the concatenated gene tree using Mr. Bayes. So Mr. Bayes had the highest support values as compared to the maximum likelihood. Um, and I used concatenated genes because having the concatenated genes rather than looking at a singular gene gave better results. So as you can see, they all share a similar ancestor, um, which means that the genus was resolved as monophyletic. Um, and there are also two clades. So up here is kind of a southern hemisphere clade, and down here is a northern hemisphere. And so the southern hemisphere is where all um, the South African species are over here in blue. And over here is the Northern Hemisphere. So there are less support for the relationships in the Northern Hemisphere. As you can see, um, there are lower support values, which can, can be resolved by adding molecular data or nuclear data. Um, and over here, you can also see that there is less support for the Northern Hemisphere clade. So there definitely needs to be more data on the Southern Hemisphere before we can accurately say that um, there is actually a split between the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere clades. So zooming in a little bit on this. So as you can see over here, species one and species two is seen as a polytomy. So the species aren't fully resolved and instead of being split into two clades, species one and species two, they were all put together. Um, so even though it wasn't fully resolved, the ABGD analysis, like I mentioned previously, shows that these two species are actually distinct. So patterns in previous literature, as I mentioned previously, um, shows that South African species are closely related to North Atlantic species. As we can see here from this tree and over here, the purple is um, the Northern Atlantic and the blue is the South 
African species and they aren't um, each other's closest relatives. So species one and species two are each other's closest relatives. So this is an interesting thing that we have found and one other genus of nudibranchs that show the same split between northern and southern hemisphere clades are um, the Acanthodorus genus, but there needs to be more information, as I said, on the southern hemisphere before we can accurately say that we see this split between the northern and southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, you can also see that there are different clades. So there's an eastern Pacific clade that has at least one lineage though it seems like there might be multiple. Um, there's the Northern Atlantic, as I mentioned, with Calina pellucida and Calina lavis. And there's also the Northwest Pacific, which is closely related to the Northern Atlantic clade. So over here in red, um, and Calina hyponica is also over here. Um, and there's the Eastern Pacific in green. So one other thing that I wanted to mention is that over here you can see that there are two species that are labeled luteo marginata, and this is because there isn't enough information to tell which one is the true luteo marginata, um, and so there needs to be more information and more research on that as well. So this is just a small map of kind of showing the ranges of all these species, just so you can see it visually instead of me just telling you where everything is. Um, this isn't complete. There definitely isn't all the species that um, is known in the world, but it's just a little small graphic to show you um, the different clades. And so looking into the future, I will be finishing the publication for review with Dr. Rebecca Johnson, Dr. Terry Gosliner, describing these species and adding this molecular data as well. We'll also be adding species from California to um, resolve some of the relationships in the Northern Hemisphere and to understand those relationships better and just to have more data in the tree. Um, hopefully in the future, there are scientists who can collect more data on Kedlina from the Southern Hemisphere. There is definitely a lot of bias, especially colonial bias, when looking at information from the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. There is more information on the Northern Hemisphere as compared to the Southern Hemisphere. And this is, um, yeah, due to colonial bias, since there are a lot of colonial countries in the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere is disregarded and understudied. So we lack information, especially from South America and these temperate regions where Kedlina is found. And so it's important to have community science to work to collect this data and be equitable when working with colleagues in this area. We want to have people who are familiar with the area and understand the area who can give us this information and who we can work with in the future. And using these skills and lessons I've learned, I also want to bring this work to the Philippines. I want to do research in the Philippines, whereas, which is where I am originally from. Um, and I hope to have applied research, hopefully in genomics, where I can help with conservation efforts in the Philippines for coral reefs or marine conservation. So before I end, I just want to acknowledge a couple of people. So first, my mentors, Dr. Rebecca Johnson, Dr. Terry Gosliner, and Lynn Bonomo the SSI directors, Doran, Dr. Lauren Esposito and Dr. Rebecca Johnson, the lab technicians, Athena Lamb and Lynn Bonomo, J Jacob Lerneau and Kate Montana for helping out throughout the whole entire SSI program and planning all our lectures and collections tours, um, the National Science Foundation and the California Academy of Science, Sciences for funding this RAU, the collection managers and staff who took time out of their day to give us collections tours, um, the SSI lecturers who also took time out of their days to tell us about the research that they've been doing at the California Academy of Sciences. And also, lastly, my fellow SSI interns for being with me throughout the entire program and helping me and um, just being my rock throughout everything. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I'm now open for questions. <laughs> That was, that was great. I love the little beauty breaks. Um, <laughs> I was a bit surprised by the, um, the fact that the Northern Atlantic and the Northern Pacific species were more closely related than all the Pacific species. And I think, you know, nudibranchs use a lot of oceanic dispersal. So do you have any explanation or hypothesis for what might be going on there? Um. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm not ex exactly sure. I definitely, I think there needs to be more research in these areas before we can be sure um, that um, these relationships are correct, first of all, and that um, they hold true when there are more specimens that come in and when we have um, more species that we can study. Um, but yeah, I'm not exactly sure about that, sorry. <laughs> We have a question from one of our online viewers, Samantha, who says, nice job. I may have missed it, but how many of the previously described species do you have in your analysis for this genius? Is it 100, 75%, et cetera? Okay. Oh, we use all of the species that were found on GenBank. So all of the species that um, have been described and have been added on to GenBank um, and have been put in different papers in the past. Great. Samantha would also like to know whether you happen to know off the top of your head how many undescribed species there are currently. Um, unsure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm unsure. There definitely are species um, that we know of in this tree that seem to be undescribed. Um, one over here that says Cavina species A seems to be an undescribed species because it is grouped into its own um, grouped into its own clade and was mislabeled as um, some other species. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure about the rest of the cabina. So I'm sure there's a lot. As I said, um, this is a genus that is relatively understudied in some areas. All right, everyone. It's on. All right, everyone. We're going to um, quickly switch the mic before I. This one seems to work a little better, and we can have the less powerful mic for the questions. And that just means questioners talk a little louder. All right. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, so next, we have Abigail Fritz who will be talking to us about morphological diversity and molecular phylogenetics of North Pacific octocorals. And this summer, Abigail worked with Dr. Gary Williams, and she comes from, to us from the University of Dallas. Over to you, Abigail. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Rebecca just said, I'm Abigail Fritz, and I work with Dr. Williams studying the morphological diversity and molecular phylogenetics of North Pacific octocorals. I want to start by introducing you to Octocorallia. It is a monophyletic clade containing the blue corals, soft corals, sea fans, and sea pens. Um, there are more than 350 genera and 3,400 species in this group, so it is a highly diverse group. It's distributed throughout um, global marine ecosystems at all depth ranges. Uh, I think that the greatest depth at which it's been found are 6,000 meters under the surface of the ocean. So anywhere there's water, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, the defining characteristics of this group are that its basic body plan consists of a single polyp or numerous polyps joined to form a colony by a common tissue layer. Um, polyps are just these cylindr cylindrical structures with a mouth at one end, a gastrovascular cavity in the middle, and some tentacles ringing the mouth. Um, they have eightfold symmetry of these tentacles and of the gastrovascular me mesentery. And they have sclerites rather than a solid calcium carbonate skeleton. These are calcium carbonate spicules, tiny little fragments um, that are embedded in soft tissue or in protein matrices to provide support in, um, to the octocoral's body. So with regard to octocoral systematics, it's remained largely unresolved despite um, a lot of study over the last um, 200 years due to the difficulty in um, delineating species based on morphological characteristics. So there is significant variation in characteristics and there's significant variation within species. So you will have um, a lot of branching patterns can be heavily influenced by environmental conditions as can sclerite can, um, shape and formation. You will have a lot of um, homoplasy or uh, the evolution of homologous traits. You'll have a lot of hybridization between closely related groups and reticular evolution in which two separated lineages remerge to create a new one. 
Um, I think these pictures highlight these issues really well. They are three separate genera from three separate families, um, Juncea, Lepidisus, and Radicipes. Uh, but despite being relatively distantly related, you would not be at fault for grouping them together because they all have that exact same wiry shape with a curl at the end and the evenly distributed large polyps. So as you might expect, the introduction of molecular analysis has offered the opportunity for significant insight into octocoral systematics. However, um, hybridization and reticulate evolution, those are still issues when you're looking at molecular sequences. Um, and in addition to this, there has been a limited number of taxa included in recent molecular studies. I believe that the most recent study that I looked, large scale study I looked at, included less than half of the genera in Octocoralia. So it's a very large group. You need a very large data set to perform an effective analysis. It is for this reason that despite um, having had a few papers come out recently, the current taxonomy, that the current recognized taxonomy has not been updated to reflect the results of those studies because more work needs to be done before we can be certain about those and make those changes. Um, currently, there are three recognized orders within Octocoralia, Alcyonaceae, which contains the soft corals and sea fans, Helioprasi, the blue corals, and Panaceae, which is the sea pens. The subordinal groups within these are actually not clades. They haven't been recognized as clades for a very long time. They are just grades of colony formation. So, Systematics within this group is so has been so vague historically that instead of trying to establish these monophyletic relationships, um, researchers have used these terms to describe the morphological characteristics and the growth habits of different types of corals. Recent studies have revealed that there are two major um, monophyletic clades within the group, Holoxonia alcyonina, which takes um, most of the soft corals and sea fans. Um, from what well, makes takes most of the soft corals from Alcyonaceae, the former order, um, and then Calcaxonia panaceae, which takes the sea pens and some analyses the blue corals, though that differs based on the study, and uh, then some of the soft corals and sea fans from Alcyonaceae. This is where our project comes in. So we um, we're working to add to a growing library of North Pacific octocoral sequences and create a phylogenetic tree into which new samples could easily be added in the future, aiding the determination of their identity if it is an unknown species or relationships to known taxa if it's a species that is being described. Um, through this process, um, we could create a cycle of data set enrichment and phylogenetic tree use that would continuously improve our analysis over time. Our data set currently, um, I drew from the sequences that I did this summer, as well as those done by previous interns um, who have worked on this project. It includes 46 samples um, of North Pacific octocorals representing 30 genera and 17 families, all of which are currently classified as belonging to Panaceae or Alcyonaceae. We have four of the six Alcyonaceae subordinal groups represented and both of the Panaceae. Um, samples were collected primarily from the Philippines and from California, with a handful from the Aleutian Islands in Japan at a wide range of depths. So as well as having this very, this diverse sample set in terms of taxonomy, um, we have a diverse sample set in terms of geographic range, which again offers opportunities as this data set grows to perform analysis of um, how relationships differ based on the locations and depths at which um, they are collected. Samples were, um, the most shallow sample was collected at less than six meters under the surface while the deepest was taken from more than 2,600 meters. So uh, we focused primarily on sequencing with this project. Um, and we attempted to attain sequences using the Sanger method for three genes from each sample. All genes of interest are mitochondrial and protein coding, which is advantageous because um, rates of octocoral mitochondrial evolution have been evaluated as being slow compared to other animals, which makes these genes informative for genus and family level analyses. However, they do lack the resolution to accurately describe relationships within many genera, which is going to become evident when we see our tree later on. There's a lot of polytomies at the gen genus level. Um, we have the primary gene of interest was MSH1 because it is a snap morph for octocoralia. Um, octocorals are the only metazoan that possess this gene. And the basic workflow that we went through was DNA extraction, sampling from the tip of each octocoral branch. Um, 
followed by PCR amplification, gel electrophoresis to evaluate the success of PCR, cycle, cycle sequencing, ethanol precipitation, and sequencing with ABI 3130. The first gene that we looked at, as I said, was MSH1. We extracted DNA from 19 samples. This is my data, um, not other students. I don't know about their success in PCR and gel, so I'm not including that here. Um, but I extracted DNA from 19 samples. I successfully amplified um, DNA from 10 of those, sequenced 10 of those, and obtained four sequences. Um, as you can see in my gel, something went wrong <laughs> with the last two rounds. We aren't exactly sure what. Uh, it could be a reagent issue. If I were continuing this project, there would be a lot of troubleshooting involved, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure Lynn would be very involved in that, so. <laughs> but um, as it is, we're just going to leave it. <laughs> so, ND2, um, again, second gel didn't work for any of these, no clue why. But with ND2, we had more success overall. 17 samples were successfully amplified and we obtained nine sequences. Um, and this is about the same success rate that we had for ND6. So this could reflect a difference in general success rates with these genes. I don't, I'm not sure I would have to look into that more. Um, and I think that is a valid line of investigation for people who are interested in doing more work in this, uh, with this sample set. Um, we also looked at the skeletal morphology, though we did so primarily to illustrate the differences between um, in sclerite composition and formation because these are the primary feature that have historically been used to determine relationships based on morphology. There's, as you can see here, there is a lot of differences um, between species. We have um, a Pinatulacine um, Balticina on the top, an Alcyonaceae Holoxonia group, Proplexor in the middle, and then Alcyonaceae Alcyonina um, on the bottom, Drosimia. So the top it would be C pen, and then I believe that the bottom two are soft corals, or is it C pen and soft coral? Soft coral, okay. I was waiting for the nod. Um, <laughs> For all of these, we prepared them by dissolving tissue. We collected from the same site on each um, specimen from a branch tip because sclerite composition or sclerite formation differs based on where you collect, as well as between individuals, as well as based on environmental conditions. Um, so we collected from the same area, dissolved the tissue in bleach, um, washed the remaining sclerites with water, and transferred them to the SEM stubs and microscope slides. We imaged them with the scanning electron microscope to get a sense of the shape and size. Um, shapes, there's a lot of words in the literature to describe shape. I've included some of my favorites here. I think that wart club is very fun um, as a descriptor. The size ranges from 50 to 500 microns. And then with light microscopy, we um, image the color that is evident in these. So while sclerites are formed from calcium carbonate, um, proteins are also added into that, um, added in during the process. And that provides the color that actually when you look at a coral, um, especially one that doesn't have symbionts, what you're looking at is the skeletal uh, material. The tissue is actually clear, so all the color comes from the skeleton. Um, issues with the, using steric comp um, comparison, as I said, it varies within individuals, within um, species, and it's hard to determine what differences result from differences in actual like species characteristics versus what are location-based. Um, so that brings us back to our sequence analysis and why we were focusing so heavily on this. After obtaining our sequences, we used Genius to make assemblies, consensus sequences, and multiple sequence alignments. Um, Blast was used to verify sequence identities because we did have some issues with, I think we've had, we were pulling data from five different people, um, including myself, and everyone has slightly different methodologies and naming systems and mistakes are made along the way. So there was more data validation than I expected with this, and I wasn't entirely happy with where I left it off. There was still work to be done there. Um, but we used BLAST to verify the sequence identities for anything that was showing up in a weird place in the multiple sequence alignments. So there were a lot of iterations of that process. Um, we used sequence matrix to concatenate multiple sequence alignments, um, IQ tree to perform tree construction using maximum likelihood method, and fig tree to perform tree customization. So that brings us finally to our tree. Um, you can see here that there are two very distinct groups. And these do line up with um, the recent studies establishing those Holoxonia, Alcyonina, and Calcaxonia Pinatulaceae groups. I'm going to examine each of those separately. So with Holoxonia, Alcyonina, you have those soft corals, those sea fans. Um, 
And you can see that um, there are some polytomies present, as you can see, like with Caligorgia up there um, and with the Paraplexor Manila Echinogorgia. These are likely the results of um, either these genes not being suited for that purpose and that resolution level, or needing to do more work with cleaning up these sequences. Maybe there are naming issues, we're not sure. Um, there are also some specimens that, I left one specimen that we had issues with in here as an example, 2906 Manella, that is two sequences taken by different people from the exact same specimen. And they're showing up pretty close by, but in different spots. So there's a lot of work to be done in figuring out what those issues are and how to resolve them. Um, with Calcaxone and Pinactulase, we can see that um, up in here, uh, this is all alcyonina or alcyonase um, subordinal groups from the current classification system. Here we have Pinatulase um, subordinal groups mixed with um, Alcyonase subordinal groups. So we have Calcaxonia has been re um, routed over with the Pinatulase um, to as a sister um, clade to it. Next steps for this would include expanding our existing data set, focusing on unrepresented Stolonifera and underrepresented Alcyonina and Sleraxonia subordinal groups performing additional quality checks on data before maybe possibly uploading it to GenBank so it could be available to other researchers, um, and seeing what other types of analysis we could do with this data set. Like I said, geographical analysis would be really interesting, looking at population genetics, um, possibly investigating the radiation of diversity over time. There's a lot of corals in the Cal Academy um, collections, and I would be really excited to see what people can do with them. So acknowledgements, um, Dr. Gary Williams for all of his guidance and help on this project, the previous interns who have worked on this and have provided their data to me, Lynn and Athena for all your help in the CCG lab, especially Lynn, um, all of those, um, all of that sequence help. Kate Montana, Jacob Gourneau, Rebecca Johnson and Laura Esposito as program directors and to the NSF and Cal Academy for allowing all this to be possible. I'm not sure if you said this and I missed it, but but um, I just I just repeated. Did were all these corals from like a particular geographic region, or were they from all over? The They're region? from all across the North Pacific Ocean. So Philippines and California coasts are where most of our samples were cut from. Um, we also had some from the Aleutian Islands up by Alaska and Japan. So like the North Pacific Ocean, that kind of circular section with the Philippines and California, it was all across that range. And did you notice like any sort of unexpected geographic affinities that overrode mm -hmm. like what you'd expect? I think that because we have such a wide geographic range and such a broad range of taxa evident, we would need a much greater number of sequences to be able to answer those questions. If we had investigated within a family, that's probably something we could have done, but um, with our data set, it wasn't possible. That was, that was a great talk. Thank you. I, I have worked club indelibly <laughs> on my brain. <laughs> um, I, I, it kind of a follow-up question to Lauren. And did you, so I, I always feel like soft corals are the poor cousin of hard <laughs> corals and that they don't get like conservation attention and they're often neglected. And, <laughs> so I love them. They're beautiful. And I think you really uh, convinced me of that even more. Um, so I'm wondering, when you build a, a, a tree like this, a really great tree, um, a work in progress, but how yes. will that goal of a great tree maybe help the conservation of these corals? And I'm wondering if, if any of the structure might map to habitat mm -hmm. or uh, depth or, or geography, but I know that's, that's a little mm -hmm. harder, but just thinking about the, the, how the tree would help for conservation mm -hmm. of these beautiful I think that would be the ultimate goal of a project like this is building a robust data set that can be used by anyone to answer those questions when they are ready to approach them. Um, as I said, we need to add a lot more samples to it. Maybe next year's intern will be able to work on that. Um, and adding to this, um, I think that systematics really is the foundation of biology because you can't conserve something if you don't know what it is or where it's at. 
and this work um, of establishing these relationships and figuring out what things are and how they're related for the first time um, really serves that purpose. Okay. All right, thanks so much for our first session's worth of speakers. Um, we'll take a short break and resume back at 11 a.m. All right, so see y'all back on the live stream with a different link. So if you're on the live stream, you need a different link for the next section. Um, check your calendar, invite the Cal Academy folks, um, and everyone else will see you back here at 11. Right. Thanks.